Okay. All right. Thank you. So um, I do want to put in a little plug for um, a tick workshop that we offer at Ohio State uh, every other summer on ticks. So in um, in even years, so in 2014, we'll be doing a tick and mite workshop, and, and we have one whole week just on ticks. So if some of you are interested in uh, attending that, uh, just uh, search for Acrology Summer Program, and it'll have the dates and information on that. So with that, I'd like to get started. Um, and I'd like to give credit to other state agencies in Ohio, uh, the Ohio Department of Agriculture, uh, Ohio Department of Health and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and of course the Ohio State University. We've all been working together closely uh, trying to assess what's happening in Ohio and really in, in the Midwest as well with um, with uh, this emergence of these uh, diseases and, and, and the ticks. So uh, it is a collaborative effort. So and, I, and I'm part of the entomology department, but also have an appointment at OSU Extension and the Center for Life Sciences uh, Education at Ohio State. So uh, we have this first slide here, and it um, really has two key points. Uh, the first one is uh, the picture of the tick on a tick drag or a flag there. Uh, remind me that uh, this tick is uh, potentially active all 12 months out of the year, even uh, during cold, uh, the cold season. So for uh, certainly in Ohio, most people aren't thinking about getting ticks on them in December uh, with snow on the ground. You're not thinking about doing tick checks and putting on repellent. So this tick definitely did not get the memo about uh, proper tick behavior. And um, the other is that this tick generally lives in, in wooded uh, uh, settings. It's not in uh, sort of open grassy areas as we normally think of as tick habitat in Ohio where we see the American dog tick. So there are two really key things here that are different about this tick. It's activity period and also where it lives. So I'd like to set that up as a, as a beginning. Uh, although some of these slides are labeled as Ohio, uh, really we can look at this uh, more broadly than just Ohio. Um, but uh, just a snapshot here. Uh, we do have established populations of the black-legged or deer tick in, in, in Ohio. Uh, the genus Exodi scapularis. I call them BLTs. It's not the sandwich, um, but um, they're definitely established in Ohio. And we think they're in at least 26 counties. Um, and certainly I can go to Ashtabula, Coshocton, Harrison, and Holmes County. And those of you who are from Ohio know where those areas are and, and collect those ticks on just about any given day. Um, some of those ticks are infected with uh, Lyme disease. A causative agent is Borrelia burgdorferi. And uh, Fortunately, human cases in Ohio still remain relatively low despite the discovery of these ticks. And we'll talk about a timeline in just a few minutes. And it, but uh, what has changed is uh, almost all the cases in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, those folks had out-of-state travel history. And uh, today, more than half of those cases are contracted in state. So they're being bitten by, uh, by these ticks and contracting Lyme disease. We also know that dogs are, are being infected by Lyme disease in Ohio. And again, I'll talk more about that in a minute. So uh, really the take home message is that uh, this tick can be active 12 months out of the year. So really there's no off season. And a lot of people especially are uh, treating their dogs, their pets seasonally. And at least where this tick is found, uh, that's gonna be uh, a change in how they uh, deal with this, with this tick. So let's just start with some uh, tick factoids here that get us all on the same page. Uh, ticks really are, uh, they're only blood feeders. There's no other source of uh, nutrition for them. They are slow feeders uh, compared to mosquitoes and bed bugs uh, that are relatively quick in taking a blood meal. These ticks may take days or weeks uh, to get a blood meal, which means that uh, by feeding slowly, they're much more likely to become infected with any pathogen that's in that host. Uh, so that's, that's very different. Uh, they're also long-lived. A lot of arthropods, and of course we know about 17 years cicadas, they, they live a long time, but uh, most, most arthropods you think of as living for weeks or maybe months. But ticks can easily live for, in, a, in the adult stage, for four years. And the American dog tick, which is real common here in Ohio, may live up to three years without a blood meal. Um, which means that ticks are not only can uh, not only be vectors 
or transmitters of disease, but because of uh, their long life, they also become reservoirs. And so this is kind of out of the box thinking now because we normally don't think of arthropods as being reservoirs of disease. Another big one is transovarial transmission. Uh, when there's a, a, a new disease, an emerging disease, one of the first things that has to be determined is will that female tick transmit that pathogen to her offspring? And if she doesn't, then the question is how is this disease maintained in nature? And so fortunately for Lyme disease, the black-legged tick or deer tick does not transmit the pathogen to, to her offspring. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, though, uh, is transovarily transmitted by the female dog tick to her offspring. So uh, two very different scenarios there in terms of how the, these two diseases are maintained in nature. The other one, is, another one is high reproductive potential. Whereas you look at mosquitoes and bed bugs, things like that, uh, you're looking at hundreds of offspring. Whereas ticks, uh, we're looking at thousands of offspring. And the range is somewhere between 2,000 eggs laid by uh, the black-legged tick and 6,000 eggs laid by the American dog tick. But what this uh, shows you is that uh, when a female tick does drop off, uh, you potentially have a lot of ticks for a starter set, so to speak. Another issue with ticks is, is their host range. And what I mean by this is how many different kinds of hosts will each developmental stage feed on. And um, many of the pest ticks are what we call universal feeders, and they'll feed on a lot of different hosts. So this means that it's much easier for that tick when it's introduced into an area uh, to uh, get a foothold, so to speak, because about anything that walks by, crawls by, uh, is potentially a host. Uh, fortunately, a lot of the ticks, and here in Ohio we have 12 or 13 species, many of them are very host specific and, and rarely get on things other than their primary host. So this is kind of a snapshot on, uh, on uh, tick factoids. Uh, so uh, we'll move on then to the life cycle. There are about 850 kinds of ticks in the world, which as a group uh, is relatively small. For example, there are over 2,000 species of chiggers in the world. So my acrology colleagues always sort of uh, give me a hard time about uh, ticks being a small and relatively unimportant group just because uh, the, the small number of tick species. But uh, there are two, two major uh, families of ticks, the hard ticks or agacids, and the, uh, the, the soft ticks, rather, the argacids and the hard ticks, the exodids. And uh, most, most uh, many of the 850 t uh, species are hard ticks, and most of them use what is called a three-host life cycle. And that's illustrated by the boxes there uh, with the different shadows of uh, hosts represented. So the life cycle is basically once the eggs hatch, you've got a six-legged larva that emerges and is hungry and feeds for approximately uh, three days. And when it's engorged, it drops off and then molts uh, to a nymphal stage, which adds a pair of legs. And they likewise usually feed on small uh, hosts and uh, feed for, again, for about three days, you drop off and molt to the adult male or female. And uh, two different really feeding strategies for the adults. The adult male may get on a host and stay on that same host for a whole, a whole season. For example, a dog tick uh, may stay on that animal through the whole season if it's not groomed off or if there's no anti-tick product on there. And he just waits for females to get on and, and mate with them. The female, on the other hand, gets on and she feeds, if she's been mated, uh, for 6 to 14 days, depending on the, the species of tick. And she won't complete feeding unless she's mated. So once she reaches a certain, certain stage of feeding, she'll emit a pheromone, and this will draw males to her. And once she's mated, generally she'll feed up in uh, 12 to 24 hours, become that big gray tick uh, that uh, many of you have seen on, on animals and on people, unfortunately. And uh, when, when they're engorged, they drop off and then find a a comfortable place, usually uh, under leaf litter and turf where the humidity is high, and then uh, commence to laying their eggs. And uh, there are whole a lot of different strategies for egg laying. Uh, they may hold on to their eggs for a good period of time to avoid harsh environmental conditions and then lay their eggs at some point. Uh, or she may lay her eggs and then the eggs may not hatch for a good period of time. So there are all different sorts of strategies in terms of uh, reproduction. and. Uh, and uh, that's uh, basically the snapshot. Uh, and the, the adult ticks do usually feed on medium to larger uh, animals. So uh, this is basically the, 
three host life cycle and it may take anywhere from one, two or three years to complete complete the life cycle depending on where you are sort of north to south and, uh, and what the species of tick is. So that's the basic uh, three host life cycle. Now um, in terms of the ticks uh, uh, that are sort of in the upper Midwest, Ohio uh, specifically, uh, but these ticks are also found widely distributed uh, really east of the Great Plains. And Exodia scapularis, Amblyoma americanum, and Dermacinter variabilis, the ticks that are uh, in red there, are the ones that are our primary pest ticks. The ones that are in black, uh, the Exodia species, uh, the Dermacinter albopictus, Ripocephalus sanguineus. Um, certainly these ticks are out there and they, they do in some settings cause problems just uh, by their uh, feeding, but uh, are not serious concerns primarily because they don't transmit diseases that are important to humans or, or animals. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is, is go through these ticks in red and talk a little bit about uh, each of them, but spending most of our time on this uh, black-legged or deer tick that's becoming more of a problem in our part of the country. Um, and um, just a, a sort of a, a snapshot of, of how these ticks look and a little bit about their biology and when they occur. I put the American dog tick at the top because here in Ohio it is primary is the is the most important tick in terms of of its distribution and how many people are or, or animals are bitten by this tick. And you can see the markings on that tick are very distinct. The male on the left uh, has a hard shell over its back and really doesn't uh, engorge uh, with very much blood, but does feed. And on the right, you can see the female with that shield occupying the front third of the tick. And then that sort of dark back end, that's actually the part that's going to accommodate the blood meal. And it, it, it actually grows and expands as the tick feeds. Now, these ticks are found primarily in late March all the way through July. And at least here in Ohio, uh, that tick was even seen through uh, even into September. Habitat preference for this tick is primarily in grassy areas and long, along paths and roads. And uh, so that's kind of the dog tick uh, identification and habitat information. And then in the lower right, the Lone Star tick, uh, Amblyoma americanum, also has ornamentation. It's a tick that's about, a, about half the size of American dog tick. And the female on the right has a spot on the back, thus the, the name Lone Star. And on the left, you can see the male. And likewise, he has, a, he has markings on him and a, a sort of a shield or scutum that covers the, the, the upper surface. And uh, all three life stages of this tick are a problem, <clears throat> biting uh, you know, about any kind of host that uh, would, would come by. It's, it needs a little more shade. Uh, it tends to be more in shrubby areas and, and uh, forest habitats, which is different from the American dog tick. And then on the lower left is the black-legged tick, or deer tick, or BLT, Xodes scapularis. Um, it really has no ornamentation. Yeah, it is a small tick, uh, even smaller than the Lone Star tick, and probably a third the size of the American dog tick when it's when it's unengorged. So uh, this creates a problem partly because of its small size. It's it's harder to feel when it crawls on you, uh, and less likely to be detected. And um, you know it uh, doesn't have any of those markings that we talked about uh, on the other two ticks. It's uh, all three life stages, just like the Lone Star tick, are, will feed on uh, multiple kinds of hosts. And as I mentioned uh, with the first slide, uh, this tick is active potentially one stage or the other all 12 months out of the year. So this is kind of an overview. Um, uh, these pictures I, I borrowed from my colleague at Texas A&M, Pete Teal, and we have this uh, posted on the ODNR website if you'd like to download it and print it off at some point. <clears throat> Okay, this is uh, uh, the tick submissions to the Ohio Department of Health uh, up through July of 2012. And the numbers have changed a little bit. Uh, pretty much uh, the dog tick season is over, but just since this slide was uh, created uh, in July, uh, we've added, uh, we're up to 125 black-legged ticks submitted to the Ohio Department of Health Zoonosis Disease Program. And you can see some of the other ticks that are submitted, uh, but a small in comparison to small number in comparison to the American dog tick and the black-legged tick. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's uh, let's hit let's go through these uh, three main pest species. Uh, starting first with the American dog tick, 
Now this is, a, you kind of look at this like a baseball card. If you're a baseball card uh, collector, this kind of has a snapshot of the most important information about the tick. It is a dermacenter variabilis. Uh, it, and uh, the good news is that at least here in Ohio and much of the uh, Midwest, fewer than 2% of these ticks carry Rocky Mountain spotted fever. But as most of you know, it can be a fatal disease when it's not treated. And the tick has to be attached for more than a day to transmit the disease. So this is good news. And really, this combination of low infection rate and the fact the tick must be on for more than a day and that the tick is relatively large. We have uh, a lower incidence of, of this disease here in Ohio than, uh, than one might guess based on how many ticks uh, bite people and, and humans. Um, I don't show the larval and nymphal stages here because we rarely see them. They're, almost, they're very host specific on mice. So uh, about all we ever see are the uh, adult males and adult males and females. <clears throat> they are active beginning in April usually, and uh, we find them uh, up through uh, July, and then they start to tail off uh, through late summer and uh, uh, early fall. <clears throat> and this, uh, just uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the distribution for the American dog tick, uh, basically east of the Great Plains. <coughs> And there are some areas of the country where this tick is not common, and it's uh, sort of the upper, in the upper Midwest where we have uh, cold winters with a little snow cover. This tick is, uh, is cold weather sensitive. And you can see the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever case in Ohio is around 20 cases. Uh, that, that's held pretty steady, uh, but we know our friends down in Tennessee have had an awful year with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and I think the last time I checked, it was somewhere between four and 500 cases of spotted fever, and, and that's about uh, half of our, usually the total for the whole country is 1,000 to 1,200 cases. So definitely something's going on in Tennessee with, uh, with American dog tick and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. <clears throat> okay, the Lone Star Tick, Amblyo americanum, it's uh, at least here in Ohio, becoming uh, more common. Uh, as you go further south, this, this tick does be, uh, become uh, more common. And uh, so it's, it's an emerging tick here in the state of Ohio. In terms of disease associations, uh, ehrlichiosis and southern tick-associated rash illness, or uh, star eye, is, is uh, related to the Lyme disease organism. And uh, still some work being done to try to figure out this, this relationship. The bad news about this tick is that all three life stages uh, bite people, pets, and livestock. So uh, it's definitely a nuisance tick, even if it didn't transmit any diseases. Its activity period is uh, similar to the dog tick in that it begins usually in April and spring and lasts uh, through August. And it's especially becoming more and more of an issue in, in southern counties. Um, this shows you the map. It's been assembled again by ODH. And you can see on the left-hand side for the state of Ohio, the years 2000-2010, uh, 938 ticks collected from 68 counties. And a couple of counties, especially Pike, Scioto, and Jackson, uh, have uh, thriving populations of this tick. And, tick. and in fact, in some areas, this tick has become more common than the American dog tick. Uh, but you can see it's been found in just about every county. Uh, because it does feed on birds, and uh, as they fly north in their migratory pattern in the spring, uh, they're dropping these ticks off as they as they move uh, up, up uh, north. And you can see for the year 2011, 41 ticks collected from 18 counties. Um, so this is kind of a uh, emerging problem. When I came to Ohio State in 1978, Lone Star ticks uh, were very rare. So uh, this is becoming more and more of an issue in our state. Black-legged ticks, uh, they're, they're the primary story here for today. Exodes scapularis becoming much more common, and we'll show you the emergence of that uh, with some maps in a minute. But the bad news about this tick, uh, two things. One, all three life stages will bite just about anything. And number two, uh, they carry these diseases, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, and babesiosis. And at least here in Ohio, you may not have heard of those last three. Uh, but certainly, um, ehrlichiosis is becoming more of a problem. As we talk to the uh, OSU Medical Center people, they're seeing more and more human cases. And also, uh, the veterinarians are telling us that they're seeing more cases of ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis in, in dogs. 
So in terms of disease um, risk, dogs and humans are, are uh, the ones that are most impacted by these diseases. <clears throat> okay, and I just want to really emphasize the, the size comparison. Uh, it's not difficult to identify these ticks. Um, the female tick that's kind of in the center here, uh, the American dog tick, the, the very common one. And you can see in the lower right, uh, sort of at 6 o'clock, the male, and then the female to, to his right, and, and then the nymph, which is uh, uh, butter side up. Uh, you can see quite a bit smaller, and definitely the markings make it easy to, to tell this tick from the American dog tick. And then based on activity periods, when the ticks are active, uh, a lot of times you can just know uh, based on when a tick is found, whether it's uh, a black-legged tick or maybe, maybe a groundhog tick, which uh, may look very similar. You know, there to the right, you can see the, uh, the nymph and the larva, how small they are compared to a penny. So uh, this, is, this is really creates a serious problem trying to find these very, very tiny ticks on people or on animals. Uh, you really have to be a very good observer to, to see these ticks even after they've fed for a while and become larger. Okay, let's, uh, let's sort of uh, look at the timeline here with the black-legged ticks occurring uh, here in Ohio. And I've been going to deer check stations really since the early 80s, and rarely do we, did we find these ticks on deer in Ohio. And as you can see here, uh, the pink color, uh, the numbers that are in those counties, they're really not uh, a pattern showing that we have lots of ticks being sent in one particular county, aside from maybe Ashtabula there up in the uh, northeast corner. But you can see during that time period, only 51 total ticks were sent in from 26 counties. Now we're just going to uh, look cumulatively at the addition of, of one year um, uh, with the next map. And you can see we went to 96 ticks in the 33 counties now. And you can see definitely a pattern uh, emerging up in the uh, northeast corner of the state. Now we're going to add 2011, and we'll go from 96 total ticks to 279 ticks in 44 counties. So what we're seeing here we think is not just an increase in awareness, uh, people sending ticks in, but we're seeing a, a biological phenomenon. And of course, one of the questions we're asked a lot is, okay, well, what happened? You know, what's going on? Why are we seeing these ticks now? And why didn't we see them before? We actually don't know. Um, it could be, uh, you know, the climate change issues. It could be mild winters that are uh, uh, having an impact. Uh, but it's a very complex disease. And, uh, and we actually don't know the, the answer to that question specifically. This is a map that uh, has both the county names and uh, uh, in the different colored counties indicating where we think the ticks are ag actually established. And those would be in the counties where, uh, wh that are labeled as red, uh, where six or more ticks or two life stages have been sent into the health department. Uh, if the county is in pink, then one to five ticks, and in yellow, that means no ticks have been in sen sent into the health department. Uh, the little lightning bolts the tips of those of where I've personally gone uh, to those areas and collected ticks. And uh, that would be uh, Harrison, Coshocton, and, uh, and in Ashtabula counties. So this shows you that uh, we definitely have an emerging uh, tick situation with, with uh, black-legged ticks. Um, and it looks like numerous hot spots. What we don't know about these ticks that we're seeing, having sent in is whether they're infected. We don't know what the... Uh, risk is associated with Lyme disease, so not much testing has been done. And this just shows you uh, ticks collected through July of this year in Ohio. <clears throat> Keep in mind that we, we are up to 125 ticks in 26 counties. So um, again, we're seeing a, about the same counties involved that we saw in the uh, cumulative map. Sort of going down the I-71 corridor, going from Cleveland through Columbus and down to Cincinnati. <clears throat> so let's look at this timeline a little bit uh, for a few minutes and uh, just bear with us, those of you who aren't uh, from Ohio. Uh, but I want to try to uh, give you a sense of, of how this um, problem came to light. A landowner who lives in uh, Coshocton County in 2006, his wife contracted Lyme disease in the summer 
and um, I went out to that property back then and and you can see me there in the upper right hand corner with my tick drag and we collected on that property for about two hours and didn't find any more ticks so we just uh, guessed that that uh, that uh, that might have been the only tick on their property but over the subsequent years uh, several more ticks were sent in from that location and and then in uh, March of uh, 2010 uh, actually went there because uh, the landowner found four ticks on his jacket after marking his property line found four ticks on his on his coat and the ground was snow covered so went there in March and within 10 or 15 minutes had collected uh, 10 black legged ticks in the woods right around uh, right around his house so uh, uh, indicating that he definitely had a, a, an established population of ticks on his on his property after that, uh, just that year, collected over 400 nymphs and adults from that property and one neighboring property. So, uh, and then since that time, just about any time of year, I can go there and, and uh, use my tick drag and collect ticks on that property. So we know they're definitely established there. We did a study with the Ohio Department of Health and uh, did some mammal trapping. And we, we, we found that uh, also that the... Uh, uh, paramiscus or white-footed mouse population had been exposed to these uh, infected ticks as well. So we have a, a circulating or a zoonotic disease in that in that location. Looking more specifically at that three-county area, uh, Knox County, Holmes County, Coshocton County, the red dots are confirmed cases of Lyme disease, the blue suspected and yellow uh, confirmed, un, uh, unconfirmed. And you can see uh, there in Tiverton Township where that box is, only one confirmed case. So uh, the health department uh, would have never uh, looked at that as a hot spot based on the number of cases. So just because a concerned citizen found a tick, you know, at, a, at an odd time of the year in January, that we're alerted to the possibility that there was an established population of ticks there. So uh, we're, we're continuing to rely on people to uh, save ticks uh, when they are uh, found especially during the fall and winter because uh, it's most likely that that tick is going to be a black legged tick especially if it has no ornamentation on it. And so as we step back a little bit and look at both the Lyme disease uh, case cases and also the the black legged tick distribution a couple of things are, are clear here. One there are definite regions of the country that have Lyme disease. You can see the uh, northeastern United States and you can see uh, in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota, and uh, that also corresponds where black-legged ticks are uh, in, as well. But one thing that's interesting is, as you can see where the circle is on the right-hand side uh, around the yellow, that we have high populations of black-legged ticks in the, in the southern United States, the southeastern United States, but we don't have near as much Lyme disease and really don't have time to go in that today, into that today, an explanation of it in detail, but it's thought that because of the, the uh, array of non-competent uh, reservoir hosts and uh, that it sort of breaks the cycle of Lyme disease in the southern United States. And, and we think the ticks behave a little differently down that way as well, and that may have an impact on the transmission uh, and maintenance of Lyme disease in that part of the country. <clears throat> So back to Ohio, I just want to show you a couple of things. Uh, one, even going back to the mid-80s, we've, we've been having about 40 to 60 cases a year, except for a few years. And so uh, that trend really hasn't changed very much. Um, what, what has changed has, is that uh, more than half of the Lyme disease cases in Ohio now, uh, those people have no out-of-state travel history. So they're being bitten by black-legged ticks and contracting the disease from those ticks. And it looks like we're on track to be uh, probably around uh, 60 cases or maybe a little above this year. We have 54 confirmed cases. Last year at this time it was around 44. So we're a little ahead of, of, of previous, uh, previous years. Now uh, let's just spend a few minutes and talk about Lyme disease symptoms. Uh, this information is taken mostly from the CDC website. You can see that address down on the bottom. Uh, it's, it's worthwhile checking back there periodically because as new information becomes available, uh, they update that and uh, so I'd, I'd refer you to that. And so um, what we see is that uh, 
that you can start showing symptoms as early as three days after the tick attaches, and it may take up to 30 days before uh, symptoms appear. And generally, what we see is a red expanding rash. And you really see, see two, two pictures here of rashes. There's an early uh, stage of the rash, and you can see on the, the side of this individual. And in the lower right, a sort of a ripe uh, rash uh, uh, that's been there for some time. And uh, generally what we see is that uh, that rash appears about seven days after, after the tick bite. And it's seen in about 70 to 80 percent of, of cases. And, and it may expand to be even greater than 12 inches. So uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we'd like to um, you know, comment on is that, that if that circle is less than about two and a half inches, Generally, that can be considered uh, just to be a, a reaction to the, the tick bite and not anything out of the ordinary. And in terms of the rash itself, uh, it may feel slightly warm to the touch, but it rarely is itchy or, or painful. And uh, that's, that's really kind of bad news because if that rash appears like it does on the lower right-hand side, it's on your, on your back, uh, that could uh, appear without you, without you even uh, knowing it. So, uh, it's, it's important that if you live in these er an area where this uh, tick is present and where Lyme disease is present, that, that uh, you know, routine checks to make sure you don't have a rash uh, is, is important, especially if you start to develop the, the fatigue, chills, fever, headache, muscle and joint aches, and, and swollen lymph nodes. Uh, this can be a red flag that uh, something unusual may be going on. And here in Ohio, what's been happening is that uh, folks are going in with bona fide a rash, bullseye rash, or erythema migrans, migrans, and uh, they're sent home with an antifungal cream uh, for a treatment for uh, a ringworm. And of course, the rash will disappear anyway, even without uh, any treatment. So uh, this leads people to the uh, to the wrong conclusion, and maybe antibiotic therapy really uh, doesn't get started because of a misdiagnosis. I put this slide in just to show you that. Uh, uh, here's a what I would call a normal uh, reaction to a bug bite. This person was from Canada, actually came to take our tick and mite workshop, and showed up with this uh, with this rash uh, on his uh, upper arm there. And you can see a quarter held held in place there. That this is well under you know two and a half inches, and uh, he had no other symptoms. And but the do uh, uh, a dermatologist who was taking the workshop uh, suggested that when he got home that. He might want to go on a round of doxycycline just to just to cover his bases, and uh, that rash did resolve without any any further issues. <clears throat> well, let's say uh, uh, treatment isn't uh, given with those early uh, symptoms. Now you go into what's called an early disseminated phase, which may occur days to weeks post tick bite, and uh, what we see is the spirochete is leaving. The skin where it was introduced and goes to certain parts of the body that it, it, it likes to occupy. And you may uh, actually have additional uh, lesions though on other parts of the body. Um, Bell's palsy is pictured here, can be one of the symptoms uh, where you lose muscle tone on one side of the face, uh, severe headaches, neck stiffness due to meningitis, shooting pains uh, that may interfere with sleep. Heart palpitations, uh, dizziness, or vertigo can all be uh, things that are occurring in this uh, early disseminated stage. And then, uh, still, if it's uh, left untreated, may end up with what's called late stage Lyme disease or late disseminated. That occur can occur months or years post tick bite. And about 60% of patients that are untreated uh, will have this intermittent arthritis, where you have severe joint pain. And swelling, and it may come and go initially, and then after a period of time, it may just uh, the swelling may remain. And in a few patients uh, that are untreated, they may develop these chronic neurological uh, issues, including shooting pains, numbness, or tingling in the hands and feet, short-term memory problems. Uh, so people who get into this stage uh, definitely are having their quality of life affected, and some may be so impacted that they may end up not. Uh, being able to attend school or go to work uh, because of their condition. Well, then we have some folks who, uh, without treatment uh, or even with treatment, 
uh, end up with this uh, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, as it's uh, sometimes called. 10 to 20 percent of the patients uh, may have symptoms that occur uh, and last for months to years out, even after treatment. And this can include uh, muscle and joint pains, cognitive defects, sleep dis disturbance, and the like. And these things sort of come and go. So sometimes patients are, uh, you know, sort of told that it's all in their head and uh, sort of dismissed. And so um, you know, I'm thinking here in Ohio because, uh, you know, the medical community hasn't been really tuned in to this new threat that we may have folks walking around uh, diagnosed with fibromyalgia or MS or some other malady that may be actually this uh, uh, lingering uh, Lyme disease. <clears throat> so uh, with that, uh, well, well, how do you get Lyme disease? And so this is, these are ways that you, that you don't get it. Uh, there's no evidence of person-to-person -person transmission or pet-to-person transmission. Uh, no evidence that it's gotten into the blood supply. And those of you who've uh, donated blood know they, they have uh, th thorough questioning about whether you've been exposed or may have Lyme disease. Uh, the one case that it can be fatal is uh, during pregnancy, where it can be transmitted uh, to uh, the, the fetus and, uh, and may result in a stillbirth. So in that case, the, you know, definitely the, the mom should be on antibiotic. Um, one way you won't get Lyme disease is from eating uh, wild game, uh, eating venison. And uh, obviously we don't recommend uh, sushi venison. All wild game should be uh, cooked uh, regardless. Uh, probably the greatest risk to hunters, and of course here in Ohio we got the bow hunters out there, we have uh, turkey hunters. <clears throat> the greatest risk is when the animals are being uh, field dressed and then uh, <clears throat> transported. and. Uh, one of the things we're, we are concerned about is people bringing the, the game home from maybe an area that has a tick to a, an area where the tick hasn't been introduced. And then we're, we're uh, wondering whether some of the hot spots in Ohio may be the result of, of deer hides that have been disposed or composted in people's uh, uh, yards or on their properties. <clears throat> well, uh, We've talked about humans and the risk to humans, but animals are definitely impacted by uh, Lyme disease infections. Uh, horses, uh, not a lot of work done on this. A lot of folks have horses uh, here in Ohio and in the surrounding areas. Um, as I look at the literature, I gave a talk at the uh, vet school a couple of weeks ago, sort of seeing if um, you know there's much research being done, and not much actually, and there are, isn't really a good testing available for, for horses. A study was done on some ponies where they were intentionally inoculated and uh, populated all the horses uh, should have, or ponies should have been infected, but uh, the testing indicated only 63% uh, of them had uh, were infected. So this is definitely a work in progress and uh, when, when uh, symptoms do occur, then uh, that you may have symptoms like a picture of the horse here uh, with kind of showing uh, lameness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, dogs are the main uh, concern. Uh, dogs definitely get Lyme disease. Uh, some dogs may have Lyme disease and actually be subclinical, not show any symptoms, but when they're tested, they're shown to have been exposed. When they do show symptoms, those symptoms may not really show up until two to five months after the tick bite. And certainly here in Ohio, people think the tick season's over. A dog shows lameness, is sort of pictured here. Um, you may not be connecting the dots here, thinking uh, that my dog is suffering from a tick-borne disease because it's it's winter time. Uh, when they do show symptoms, they'll they'll run a temperature. They may have this recurrent arthritis that's uh, shown in there in the picture, sort of anorexia, depression. And when uh, uh, the disease is untreated, uh, the dog may actually uh, end up with a kidney kidney failure and may die from the disease. And we see this. Uh, as a fairly common occurrence in those areas where we showed you uh, the tick prevalence and the Lyme disease cases in the Northeast and the uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, here in Ohio last year, uh, a WSU vet student Megan Gowacki, working with Dr. Shin Lee, who's our Borrelia expert at the vet school, they tested 355 dogs. Uh, 41 percent or 41 of those dogs were positive, uh, suggesting that, that they'd been exposed 
to Borrelia burgdorferi. So uh, we really think that in Ohio that uh, dogs may be the sort of canary in the cave for us and that veterinarians may be the first uh, professionals to really notice that uh, these ticks and Lyme disease may be in their area. So we're really encouraging veterinarians to do more testing when dogs come in for their annual checkup so that we can start seeing if um, infected ticks may be in their area. And it's really sort of amazing that actually there are better resources available for, for dogs than for, than for people. Uh, for example, IDEX makes a snap test uh, where they can do an in-clinic test to determine if, if the dog's infected with Ehrlichia anaplasma, Lyme disease, and, uh, and heartworm. So uh, we're really trying to encourage vets to, to do more testing. And uh, also, just as with humans, and I didn't say much about this antibiotic treatment, but uh, uh, humans respond very well, especially in early stage Lyme disease with doxycycline or amoxicillin treatment. So dogs and humans both respond very well with, with those two antibiotics. Um, but the best thing to do is, 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 is prevention. And certainly when you think about how small that nymphal stage is of the, of the black-legged tick, it's very difficult to do a, a thorough check on a daily basis on, on, on uh, dogs and, uh, and on cats as well and on people. So at least in uh, terms of the dog world, uh, using uh, products according to their label instructions can go a long ways toward uh, protecting uh, dogs and cats from exposure to, to black-legged ticks. And then uh, vaccines are also available, and numerous vaccines, in fact, for, for dogs. And again, we drive, you, uh, drive folks to the veterinarians to get their recommendations for the, for the products that they have uh, success with. Uh, the ironic thing is that we don't have a vaccine for humans. Uh, a company did develop one a few years ago, but it was taken off the market uh, because of legal pressures. Uh, it was not 100% effective and, uh, and somewhat expensive, so um, it's, there's not a, a vaccine available for, for people. And then we can talk about area control uh, for managing tick populations. And uh, this is basically rendering the, the habitats that that, that these ticks like, uh, you know, uh, less inviting, and essentially reducing uh, humidity by opening up the canopy of uh, forested areas, mowing the grass, putting mulch down, and this sort of thing can uh, discourage these ticks. And uh, also putting an underground fence or something like that in to keep, to keep uh, pets in uh, maintained areas can be very helpful as well. So I've uh, put this slide in here. Uh, this is data from the Ohio Department of Health, and it illustrates a couple of things. It, it shows you, again, that the tick can be active 12 months out of the year. Uh, last year, there were probably only a couple of days where, where the adult uh, ticks were, were not active. And um, the real troublesome uh, peak here is that red one, which is when nymphs are active. And the uh, CDC says that this is the time of year when most people get, and most animals get Lyme disease, when you've got this tiny little tick uh, active and infected with Lyme disease. And you can see the season starts uh, sort of in April and May for that, for that tick and may uh, go clear up uh, through the fall. And uh, another, another feature of this is that, um, that the nymphs come out before the larval stage, especially in the, in the upper Midwest and Northeast and, uh, and it explains how the life cycle is maintained in nature in that infected nymphs uh, become active before the larvae. So what they do is infect uh, the competent host like the white-footed mouse so that the larvae that come after that feeding on those infected mice then, then become infected. So this is how Lyme disease is, is maintained. <clears throat> well, uh, a little uh, quiz here. Uh, some myths about uh, Lyme disease and, and ticks. And first, as I travel around uh, giving tick talks, I hear people calling it Lyme's disease. And, uh, uh, but actually, it should be Lyme disease because it was named after uh, a town in Connecticut where it was first, first discovered. And so even uh, in Europe, it's called Lyme disease or Lyme, Lyme borreliosis. So 
as, as professionals, we really shouldn't be calling it Lyme's disease. And although I, I do find that folks have been calling it Lyme's, Lyme's disease for a long time, uh, it's uh, hard to correct that. So if you're one of those people, I guess, and you've been saying it uh, for a long time that way, we'd probably give you a pass. I know, uh, you know, being from Oklahoma, I can't afford uh, to call it Lyme's disease. And uh, I gotta got to call it by the professional name, I guess you'd say. Um, Another myth about ticks is, is that they, they drop from trees or jump from trees uh, onto passing hosts. And uh, that really comes from most people when they're out in a tick infested area, they tend to find them on their head or neck area. So they, and they never felt them or saw them crawling on them. So they assume that they're up in these trees dropping off uh, passing, unsuspecting passing hosts. But, but we know that uh, ticks rarely get above knee high. And, uh, and besides the black legged tick, doesn't even have eyes, so you know how would it really time its jump uh, to get on a passing host? So uh, this is a really a myth that ticks uh, to fall out of trees and uh, get on their hosts. So some people are walking around with big floppy hats trying to keep the ticks off their heads, and of course, you know that's just probably uh, if they did jump out of trees would give them a bigger platform to land on. So if you really want to, you know, prevent these ticks uh, from, you know. Uh, getting on your head, maybe uh, shaving your head would be an alternative. And of course, that make it easier to visualize the ticks too. So just sort of tongue in cheek there a little bit. Uh, another myth that I've seen on the internet is that you can get Lyme disease from a mosquito bite. And this is not true. A lot of testing has been done on this. It's not that a mosquito couldn't become infected, but they just don't transmit the disease. And uh, that uh, it's really only transmitted by two species of ticks in North America, the, the western black-legged tick and then the, the black-legged tick um, are the only two vectors of the disease. And it takes about 36 to 48 hours for, for transmission to occur. So this gives us a little window of protection. Um, the other one is that, and this is probably the biggest uh, myth, is that use of hot match, fairy nail polish, rubbing alcohol, petroleum jelly, you put those on a tick and, and it will cause the tick to back out on its, on its own. And I published two papers on this, one in pediatrics in 85 and another one in 98 in uh, wilderness medicine. And uh, really none of these methods work and they pre actually may be dangerous uh, because what they do is they delay uh, just removing the tick. And so that, that uh, provides an opportunity, more time for disease transmission to occur. And we sort of you know, uh, if you put uh, uh, Vaseline on a tick, that's going to make it harder to pull off. And of course, we caution people never put rubbing alcohol on followed by a hot match because that could go poorly. So um, anyway, the best way to, to remove a tick is just to grasp it with a pair of fine tweezers if you have them or curved ones here as shown in the picture. And then to grasp that tick as close to the skin as possible and pull up with uh, steady, even pressure. Generally, that will remove uh, the tick intact. And uh, if the mouth parts would happen to break off, we, we just recommend washing the area thoroughly and putting on a triple antibiotic. And uh, that should prevent any secondary infection. So in terms of prevention, uh, this is uh, our, our overall uh, uh, prevention recommendations that, um, that you need to know when the ticks in your area are active and uh, where to expect the ticks because they live in, in different habitats and we went over that earlier. Uh, we recommend the use of repellents but you have to be really careful with these. It's very easy to misapply them or over apply them especially products containing DEET. Um, my own personal experience is that you need at least 25 to 30 percent DEET and that can be applied to clothing or, or the skin. The problem with it is that it does off gas and the point at which it doesn't have enough uh, product there to repel ticks is, is kind of nebulous, uh, but uh, that can work very well. Uh, permethrin is another a very different product that's actually in a caricide uh, as well as a repellent and it should be applied to clothing only and actually applied to the clothing while it's not being worn and it needs to be allowed to, to thoroughly dry. So we're recommending that hunters especially pre-treat their, their boots and their pants before going out into the field. And once this product is dry, it, uh, it uh, really adheres to the fabric and doesn't produce an odor. So it's not going to alert game to your, 
to your presence. The other big one is tucking the pants into socks or boots and shirt into pants. And this just keeps the tick on the outside of your clothing so that uh, it can be seen. And obviously, you're not going to get hunters to wear white pants. But uh, wearing pants that you can see the ticks crawling on makes it easier for you when you're doing a tick check or with the buddy system, someone's making sure that you don't have ticks crawling on your, on your clothing. Which brings me to the next one, which is doing tick checks. A couple of times a day, if you know you're in a tick habitat, uh, checking each other, checking pets daily, and then removing those, those ticks as, as soon as they're, as they're found. And um, part of this, too, is if, it, if the tick is not a dog tick, then we're in Ohio suggesting that, that that tick be saved in a Ziploc baggie or some sort of a container so that um, if the individual does come down with the symptoms we mentioned earlier, that if they walk in uh, you know, with the bullseye rash and here's a tick, a black-legged tick, then uh, it's going to be easier for that doctor or healthcare professional to make a, a proper diagnosis. Around the home, you can see the picture on the right of a backyard there where the uh, grass is being mowed regularly and mulch is applied as a barrier between the mowed area and the woods. And this serves two purposes. One, the tick, since it's sensitive to desiccation, will uh, likely crawl across that uh, open area. And it also serves as a visual barrier to people that if you, once you cross over that mulch, uh, you're, in, you're potentially in, in tick habitat. Um, we're also now uh, uh, pushing people to uh, see their veterinarians and, and make sure that they're using the best products possible uh, to keep ticks from getting on their hosts and also considering using Lyme disease vaccines to protect their pets uh, should they go into uh, areas that have these ticks. And also testing dogs on a regular basis to see if they've been exposed to uh, Lyme disease or any of these other tick-borne pathogens. So just to sort of wrap things up and summarize, uh, we definitely have black-legged ticks uh, in Ohio now. Uh, so uh, folks, so physicians especially, or veterinarians that are saying to folks, you know, the dog or the person can't have Lyme disease, you haven't been out of the state. Well, can't say that now uh, because the ticks are definitely here. There are numerous uh, hot spots uh, now in the state, and people who live in those areas or who are going those, to those areas to hunt really need to be alert to the possibility of, of getting ticks on them and become potentially infected with, with uh, Lyme disease. We're up to 66 counties in Ohio uh, that uh, we found the ticks in, and uh, we are encouraging people to take ticks that aren't dog ticks to county health or county extension so that uh, they can be alerted to the possible introduction of this to human cases that uh, Lyme disease incidence or infection rate in ticks is still relatively, relatively low. <clears throat> So uh, this is uh, my last slide. If some of you've got smartphones, you want to uh, get these uh, the Tick app or bookmark the CAPC uh, the CAPCVet.org website. You can actually go to each county and find out what the risk is um, to the tick-borne diseases. In Rhode Island, uh, there's a TickEncounter.org website. And if you have any questions for me, if you'd like to email me at Sanitum.1 at OSU.edu. And with that, I'll stop. I see I still have a couple of minutes and see if we have time for questions. Great. Thanks, Glenn, for a really excellent presentation. I think my sound is back on, so that's good news. Okay. Uh, folks, I did turn the conversation pod open. And so if you have some questions, you can enter them in there for Glenn, and we'll field those as, as best we can. Uh, Glenn, Mary had a question about how long it takes for the tick to attach and feed, and possibly also to transmit uh, Lyme disease. Well, it only, that's a good question. It only takes uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes for the tick to attach and actually begin taking a small amount of, of blood. So they're very quick at doing this, and they actually glue their head in your, in your skin. So this is, uh, serves as a gasket and, uh, and uh, holds the tick in place. As far as transmission goes, it varies. Uh, for spotted fever, it's thought to be at least a day. For Lyme disease, 36 to 48 hours. But if that tick has been on another animal, for example, deer, and then it detached and then got on you, it's possible that you could have Lyme disease transmission in a very short period of time. You wouldn't have that uh, long window. Carolyn wants to know how to send, how and where to send ticks in. Yes, what we're trying to do is uh, get folks to send them in to 
uh, county extension or, or county health. And, uh, and then from there, they can do this basic identification to see if it is a black-legged tick or a dog tick or whatever. And then uh, those ticks would be sent to the health department where we're keeping track of the emergence of these ticks in specific counties. Hey, Lois asks about um, managing deer as a way to prevent Lyme disease. That's a very controversial issue. Um, the folks who've been dealing with this for a long time in the northeastern U.S., some studies have been done. And certainly deer are part of the overall issue because they can feed up literally thousands of these ticks. Uh, but you probably can't reduce the deer herd to a low enough number to impact uh, Lyme disease transmission. So. Um, that's that's probably the best way to state the issue. Your bumper sticker is popular, so how can folks get a copy of that bumper sticker? Yeah, I think email me. Uh, I just uh, got went on a website and and made up had to make uh, forty of them, I think, and I've been handing them out when I give TikToks. So it is raising awareness. It also, if you put that on your car, I just have to say you're going to get some strange looks when people drive by to see who is driving a car with that bumper sticker. It also keeps your kids from wanting to drive your car, too. So I might add that's a, kind of an added benefit. Uh, Mary asks if a person can be tested for Lyme disease years after possible infection. Actually, you may more be more likely to get a positive if you have Lyme disease after a longer period of time. If, if you test too soon, you won't have enough antibody for the test to pick it up, initial testing. So uh, let's say a person has, has symptoms uh, months or years later and it's, it's more likely that you'll pick it up after a longer period of time. Okay, Eddie asks if the center of the bullseye rash is the location where the tick was attached. Uh, that's a good question. That is true. Although, uh, you know, you could have those secondary rashes that will occur uh, after the tick has detached. Uh, but generally, yes, that's, that would be the site of attachment. Uh, Alan wonders, how in the world can you spot a tick in the hair, especially in the nymphal stage? That's really tough. It really is tough. Um, you know, dog groomers uh, tell me that, you know, it's uh, even they're careful. They can miss them quite easily. And, uh, you know, I know some people who shave their dogs, especially during the nymphal season, just so they can go over them uh, more carefully. Uh, but I'd, I'd suggest if you haven't picked your dog out yet, get one that's white and short-haired. And uh, that way you can visualize the ticks better. But it really, really points out that uh, you, you just can't check a, a dog probably careful enough, carefully enough. And it's really a, a better strategy is putting an anti-tick product uh, that your veterinarian recommends uh, on, the, on the dog or on the cat. And I might mention that, that the, this black-legged tick loves cats um, because of the way that they hunt. They're crouching down. They pick up lots of ticks. And uh, fortunately, it looks like cats don't get Lyme disease.